Our last speaker this afternoon is uh, Graham Anderson. Graham, and, Graham is a senior climate specialist, DPI Farm Services Victoria. He leads climate extension program and can offer some practical insights into the carbon and emissions story for our farms. He has 23 years ex extension background in science and policy communication, farm planning, catchment management, forestry and agriculture industry, industry development. Welcome, Graham. Thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> the best thing you'll hear from me is that I'm going to do this twice as fast as what I was originally going to so that we can get to a cup of tea. I think one of the good things is that there's some recurring themes that you've heard today and I'll be just sort of really going over them pretty quick. Um, I guess one of the things about the carbon story, it's been brewing for a while. I know for at least the last sort of nine, ten years this issue has been brewing in policy circles. And one of the things is it's not actually around about if, it's just about what at any time for those of us in agriculture are going to be required to do in terms of regulations, rules, policies. I know a lot of people, and I speak with farmers every week, and they say, hey, can we just get rid of this stuff? So it's too late for that. It's just about what we're going to be required to do. That's the, that's the key issue and the risk for uh, agriculture. Farmers always ask, what the hell are they trying to do to us? What is this all about? And this is a bit of a graph from um, Warwick McCubbin, who's an economist who was on the Reserve Bank, and it made sense to me, and I'll just share it with you. It's basically got three things on this graph. It's got growth of the economy measured by GDP, it's got energy consumption, and then it's got CO2 emissions. And it's back from the mid-60s up to about 1990, and it's from the US. Now, basically, the economy and energy consumption and CO2 emissions all growing happily together up until early mid-70s, then things went backwards. We had a recession. There was a bit going on. Does anyone know what was going on at that time? All crisis, okay. So we had a global recession, energy consumption dropped, emissions dropped. But after that, the economy responded, off it went. But interestingly, energy consumption didn't track anymore. Why not? It was too expensive because that was the whole thing. Oil was very expensive. But what do we do when something gets expensive? We start using our grey matter and look at ways and we bring forward technologies which get better at it. And essentially what, you know, we're living through an era where energy is going to be, you know, that's going to continue. And part of our challenge is how we get better with energy um, uh, and actually grow the economy. The other thing which I guess all this carbon price stuff is about is we just happen to be living in interesting times where there's a lot of people that are trying to put a wedge between energy consumption and CO2 emissions. So we're living in an era over the coming decades where we're expected globally and nationally to keep growing the economy while energy consumption flattens and CO2 emissions actually start dropping. Now we've never done it before and there is no guarantee we're going to be able to do it, but that's what's being asked of us. So the challenge is about how and how is it going to affect us in agriculture. Um, the other most common question I get is what the hell, why all this fuss about poor old carbon dioxide? I mean we need it, it's not toxic, we breathe it in and out, it's essential for our plants. And I guess the little story I like is uh, back to the 1850s when there were some scientists, one called John Tyndall um, uh, in the UK, and he, they were looking at, during the day we get energy from the sun, it warms things up, just like the dashboards on our cars getting sun this afternoon, warms it up. When the sun sets, uh, that heat uh, radiate, should just radiate back out to space overnight. And as a kid growing up in Ballarat some mornings, I thought all, this, all that heat had radiated away and it was frozen in the morning. But they worked out that there's quite a difference, that the heat that we get every day doesn't all escape each night, that the world is warmer every morning than it should be. So John Tyndall did an experiment and he trapped, he got basically the different gases from the atmosphere and passed heat radiation through them to see what's trapping heat. And the simplest thing he did was, he said, well, 99% of our atmosphere is just uh, nitrogen gas or oxygen. So I'm going to get rid of all the other gases and pass this heat radiation through those two. And he did that, and the heat passed straight through untouched. So he said, if our atmosphere was just nitrogen and oxygen gases, all that heat would escape every night, and the Earth would be quite a bit cooler. So he tested uh, those impurities that he'd taken out, that 1% and passed the heat radiation through them and they absorbed the heat. And what he put back in was basically the greenhouse gases. It's CO2, methane, water, vapour, nitrous oxide. They, it's a physics thing. It's energy in, 
uh, and energy out. And the whole story of greenhouse gases is around if we put more of them up here, eventually we start to trap more energy. Less of that heat can escape. And the, the climate scientists and certainly NASA and everyone else say, well, we know it's about energy balance because in our outer atmosphere it's getting cooler. So if we had more energy coming from the sun, the outer atmosphere would be getting warmer too. But it's not. What we're changing is the balance of energy in and out. Just like if you had two cars parked in a car park, both getting the same energy from the sun, both dashboards warming up, radiating of heat, one car's got the windows open, one car's got the windows closed. They're both getting the same energy from the sun, but they'll have two different temperatures because it's about energy in versus energy out. So that's the story of why there's all this fuss around um, the, the greenhouse gases. And the basic theory is if we put more of them up there, it should start getting warmer. And since the 50s, I guess, that's been our observation uh, across Australia in terms of temperatures. Um, and also, you know, wherever we go in Victoria, you know, the last decade certainly has been the warmest anyone's had to farm through. Um, we don't pay much attention to temperatures because it changes so much from one day to the next. But, you know, this, we're being told to expect the coming decades to keep getting warmer. How much is about how much of this, these gases we put up there? And that's why we're talking about all of this emissions trading stuff. <laughs> emissions trading. Now, I know a lot of people are pretty fed up with this issue, but it's pretty important because it's going to be a big part of the next few decades for all of us. Um, and quite uncertain about how, um, how, this will, uh, how this journey will unfold. Because amongst it, we've got to keep growing food, providing energy and all the things that society wants. Um, trying to put it in context from a farming point of view, I think if you look at the farm window, how, what does this mean to us? I think you know, we've sort of got a bit of a, a, a yarn which is really about what are those things you can do on the farm that have some influence on this? And then what are the things that are off the farm that you can know about but really have no influence on? And that's what I'm about to run through. What can you do about on farm? How does this all come back to the farm? There's five action areas we think that farmers have control over. Um, energy story. Uh, we, we use energy and, uh, and I'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail, but it's a key one. And we have influence over how much energy we use. Uh, Above ground vegetation and carbon, land care, we've been planting trees for a lot of different reasons, that's nothing new, but there's a the store of carbon in that. We know there's a store of carbon in, below the ground in soil carbon, that's a lot of the focus for today. We can influence each of those things. Nitrogen efficiency, um, how much nitrogen is turned into product, They're, you know, that's driven by the things we do on our farms. And methane, production from livestock is largely around livestock efficiency. So these are all things that we influence and actually, without knowing it, agriculture has done a great job of these things in the last 20 years, without even trying. We've just done it as part of getting better at agriculture. So the future's around how do we get more tools and actually um, get better at doing it. The energy story, um, it's really interesting because we hear about you know, the carbon tax is going to increase energy prices by 10%. So how much have your energy bills gone up in the last five years? Sing out if you've got any. What have you noticed? They've gone up a bit. And what do you think they'll go up in the next five years? Because it's really interesting. We're in the middle of something much bigger here because um, if you talk to the energy sector, uh, they're talking about there's transmission upgrades that are happening. Now, those transmission upgrades uh, get passed on to energy users. We've got renewable energy target by 20% by the year 2020. The cost of that gets passed on to energy consumers. We've got the carbon tax. We've got a bushfire inquiry recommendations to implement, which gets passed on to energy costs. And we've got smart meter rollout. So there's a whole host of things that are all pushing energy in a certain direction. And the same we can say similar things with gas and what's happening there. Now, you can focus on the debate about what's driving it. On a, from a farm point of view, all it is about how do we get better at it. And it's what's really interesting. Um, how many of you in the last year have rung up and tried to haggle for a better energy price with your energy retailer? Put your hands up if you have. And how did you go? Put your hands up if you got a better deal. Now, it's interesting because I rang up um, about three weeks ago and automatically got a 10% discount. And we're not very good at dealing with energy. I mean, one of the fundamental things, when things are cheap, we don't pay much energy to how we get better at it. Um, the next 10 years, we're going to pay a bit more attention at how we get better at it. And the good thing is there's some low-hanging fruit there. Um, the other, how we get better at it and establish better service industries to do this is going to be really important too because I don't think we, 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 in agriculture we know where to start that well. Um, the other issue which uh, Snow brought up a bit is just about well, what's the role of 
creating energy uh, opportunities on farms. And certainly when we look in agriculture and forestry, when you look at certainly in Victorian situations where people have got a lot of heat requirement and they're currently using LPG or some form of energy to do that, uh, but you've got a heap of almond shells or olive pips or there's uh, wood sawdust, there's some, you know, some really um, great business cases for using farm waste to, to, for heat energy. And so we'll see a lot more of that happening in the coming decade. The nitrogen story is pretty clear. Like, um, you know, a lot of nitrogen leaks out of our farming systems. Uh, and whether it goes down the creek, in the groundwater or up in the atmosphere. And um, I guess we're all on the same boat here about we want to get better at it. And it's really about what are those tools and the sort of thing that Snow was talking about before, um, how we turn more nitrogen into food product. And that's a real challenge if we're expected to grow more food globally. And we have tools and things we can do. All of these things will help. Um, a lot of the time it's driven by how we can save a, duck, a buck. Um, but, you know, I guess part of the research and some of the effort with carbon farming, we're hoping that there's new tools and better products that we can use on our farms to get to turn more in straight into product rather than it disappearing. Because it's not in our interest that it disappears. The whole livestock story in methane... Um, it's really, uh, you know, I guess it's a fairly new one and a lot of livestock owners are pretty upset about how can we be being blamed for suddenly something the cows naturally do. Um, and I guess, you know, I've always amazed at this fact that, you know, if you captured the methane out of a dairy cow, you could drive a thousand kilometres. If you put that methane into a falcon, you could drive a thousand k's. It's, it's an energy loss in the system. And now there's research effort to look, well, how can we try and reduce that energy loss? And what's really interesting, if we look about... Um, you know, just again, without even trying, when we look at the dairy industry's performance or the beef industry for the last 30 years, what do you think we've done with uh, emissions per litre of milk or emissions per kilogram of meat? Has it got better or worse, do you think? They've all got better. And they've got better without us even focusing on this issue. They've got better because it's actually about drivers of productivity, better genetics, better uh, grazing management, all those things that... You know, we're, we're pretty good at But more attention at this will, will be how we actually get even more productive. So it's actually where we're wanting to go anyway. This isn't a different future. Um, soils has been a big topic for today. I guess the significant store of carbon in soils. Traditionally in agriculture, we've found it much easier to lose carbon in soils and put it back. So if we're going to suddenly put heaps in, we'll have to be doing something substantially different. It's not just like we'll keep grazing the pastures and we'll get lots of... It's not that simple um, because uh, history shows we just tend to be better at losing it. Um, there are lots of benefits from organic matter in our, in our soils and one of the key ones is just the, you know, the, the nutrient flow and also the water holding capacity. If you think about it, in a 700 mil rainfall zone, every square metre of your paddock gets 700 litres of water delivered to it. So how well is that soil set up to actually either capture some of that store it in the soil profile so that your plants can access it over spring? Or how well is it set up to just all run off? Um, and it's really interesting. Soil health is an incredibly exciting area. Uh, and whether you're getting paid for carbon, I think, doesn't really matter. I think that the real gains here are about productivity and how we use it to manage climate risk and moisture and nutrient flows and all of that. This issue about how long we can store soil carbon for um, is really important. And also we know that you know, is it safe in our soils? Longer term, if you've got a contract that's keeping soil carbon there for 100 years, you know, that's, I reckon that's a pretty dodgy, dodgy deal. We've got a similar offer with trees. We thought it was this easy. We we're going to get money for trees, um, money for jam. I, I was involved in a carbon project back in 2003 where we paid farmers for, with carbon contracts. And lots of people were really interested. And then they saw the 30-page legal agreement. Uh, that only went for 30 years, not 100 and so a lot of people lost interest. Um, it had a lot of uh, key lessons from that that I think are really relevant for today um, and happy to share them. And these are some of the things about if, if you have got a 100-year liability for the carbon in these trees um, and that goes on property title, uh, my observation is um, only 1% of farmers have participated in anything like this. It's just like there's a thing that should happen in your head about, gee, how much money am I getting and is this going to be worth what I'm signing up to here? And there's a big risk here. There's lots of great reasons for putting trees in on farms for shelter and biodiversity and, and for woodlots, but uh, 
think carefully before you. So we've got a, a, um, a, a little fact sheet on questions you should ask before you sign on the dotted line of this stuff. Um, there's some good reasons what, what, you know, where you might do it, but just know what you're getting into. And just like any other product, scale's important. We had a lot of people that thought, this contract's a bit of pain. Um, the ones that signed was all to do with how big the cheque was. So it's about scale. And funny enough, it's like lots of other commodities. It's about, you know, not everyone's going to be able to participate in this carbon market. You're going to have to need a fair volume to make it worth bothering with. Just like any other product we grow. Um, and also, just this issue of uh, um, liability down the track. You know, something that's not worth a lot today, you're signing up for. Um, how that ratio of uh, liability might change over... Uh, 50 years or whatever is a really critical issue. And I know most farmers already get this stuff. The issue that we don't have any control of from a farm point of view is what happens before the farm gate and after the farm gate in terms of processes and up and down the supply chain. We've got no control over that. Um, we know that there's costs that are coming uh, that processes will have and also up, upstream with fertilisers or what have you. It's really hard to know what amount of that cost will get passed on to farmers because... Uh, a lot of the modelling people are saying that you know, all of it will get passed on to farmers, but I know when you talk to some of those companies, they're saying, we're in a competitive marketplace, we're, we're not going to pass it all on. Um, so time will tell about how that unfolds. Um, the key thing most of us want to know is how, is this, how does this relate as an issue and as a cost compared to the influence of rising or, or changing uh, Aussie dollar, commodity prices, oil prices... Uh, you know, where does this sit? And I, I think we'll find out in the next few years. Um, I guess the great story with um, Scott and Stuart and Lucinda on farms, you know, farmers are doing this stuff, um, getting better. This is just getting better at agriculture. Um, and there's really, you know, agriculture's got a bright future, but not for everybody. And there's a whole key, you know, list of reasons and things you do to be good at it. Um, so the key points, if you, you'll hear a lot about the Carbon Farming Initiative, the great thing is it's just voluntary. You would only ever participate in it because there was a good deal being offered to you. So for the Carbon Farming Initiative, you, you don't have to do anything. So you'd only do it if someone was offering a good deal and you knew what you were getting into. There's, the, the whole R&D investment is going to bring in some your new products for, for agriculture and some you know, better fertilisers, better feed, better genetics... That's what we've got to get better at. Look carefully if you're signing any contracts. Um, think of those things. You feel better when you think about the things you have control of on your farm. And actually, if you look at those five action areas, you'll feel a lot better because most of those things you're doing things on. And that's the most practical way to look at it. Um, what I find about it doesn't matter what the issue is, that those of us that are involved in practice change and whatever changes that... Um, you know, we're looking at... There's three key things in my experience that you have to have for it to work. Any practice change. doesn't matter. It's a human nature thing. You need some proven technology that works. It's not a risky experiment. It's something that's been proven. You've got to have the attitude where people want it for some reason. Either it makes money or it saves me time or it um, has some real benefit. And you have to have the ca capacity to do it. Actually, the money or that you're confident there's service providers that'll actually help me manage this thing and what have you. And for all of us involved in trying to look at how we get better agriculture, these are the three things you need for successful practice change. Getting just two of them won't work. If you don't have all three of these, we don't progress. And I think that's really important. Um, we've got some case studies on our website, and, and I guess the, the point is that there are great things being done on farms across all industries, um, and part of the challenge is it doesn't matter which, which industry you're in, how we get better at it. The one uh, little story I'm just going to finish on is uh, often there's a big thing about, oh, is it carbon or food? We can't have both. And a good little story with Jigsaw Farms down Hamilton Way. They've um, got a lot of, uh, you know, waterways and things fenced on their farms, um, fencing out salt scolds along the valleys, and then rather than fencing just along the edge, they've taken out a bit more country to put in woodlots and things like that. A lot of trees have gone in. Um, but it's really interesting, of their 4,000 hectare farm over the last sort of 10, 12 years has been a major sort of, well, a lot of work done. Um, they've actually, this is a pretty extreme case, 25% of the farm's been put into new forests. 25%. So that's pretty extreme, you know. Um, but the 25% of that land is the less productive land. It's the saline areas, water log stuff, you know, it's the country that's not really that productive from an ag point of view. 
The interesting thing is that the, the, and most farmers look at that and say, bloody mad. But the interesting thing is, and the key bit to farms that are doing well is making the most of their best soils. So the 75% of the good soils is actually doubled its production because it's being, you know, it's being looked after like a Ferrari. You know, it's being high input, best pastures, good stocking systems. And it's really, this is a common theme that we've seen in land care, which is about identifying those areas of the farm that you can work like a Ferrari, and then those other bits, you know, actually are better put into other sort of things, for whether it's biodiversity plantings, water quality, shelter, what have you. So this carbon farming thing is actually, we can have our cake and eat it too. I don't think it's anything different than what sustainable agriculture is all about. Um, in this situation, that they've doubled, you know, the carrying capacity in terms of livestock, um, but not only is the farm carbon neutral, they've got an, uh, you know, 10,000 tonnes of CO2 a year in, in excess of what they need just to cancel. So it's car better than carbon neutral. And one of the good stories is about, well, when we look at climate risk, in 2005 was one of Victoria's warmest years, but in that February we had a cold event that wiped out tens of thousands of livestock. And on this farm they had off-shear sheep that were, you know, they were shearing at the time, went straight into all of their farm trees, didn't lose any sheep. And it was interesting, they're saying, you know, probably they had a 30-year budget for looking at the, the payback of those spotted gums, but they said it probably paid for itself in that one event, um, judging on what was, else was happening around the district. So, you know, it does all fit together. Um, and I hope that's been a useful, quick thing, and we're almost back on time. Thank you.